Excellent. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming. And um, uh, I know my name is Paul Guzman, and I'm from Vancouver, Canada. And what I have for you tonight is, um, well, it's, a, it's supposed to be a lecture demonstration, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to tell stories. And the first story that I want to sort of like convey to you is, it's actually a found story. Because when you're doing a residency in any place, basically what you try and do is you try and accumulate uh, experiences. And of course, when you accumulate these experiences, it comes out of the, the work that you do. But in a way, by telling stories, it actually makes the work a bit deeper in terms of like how I feel about it. And I just wanted to share that with you. And the first story actually is, is, I'm not the author of the first story. I was actually um, walking around, and uh, because I'm an avid book lover, I love to go to bookstores, and so I discovered this bookstore on Coolsing called Dyslexia. And so in the front of the bookstore is always the new books, and then of course you go and have a look at the new books, and think, hmm, oh, should I buy this or should I buy that? And then you go to the very back, and usually what I do is I just go and look at the covers of the books. But then there's this one very striking cover of a book that I found, and it's this one. See how beautiful it is? <laughs> but the thing about it is that I opened it up, and it, it's called Breakfast on the Mars. And it's actually a screenplay, and it has two characters in it. There is a waiter who works at the Hotel New York in Rotterdam. Now, I've never been to the Hotel New York, but having read this, and I spoke with another artist who said, oh, we had lunch there a couple of days, or had drinks there a couple of days. So it becomes very iconic in terms of Rotterdam's land, uh, architecture and Rotterdam's landscape. And a lot of my work deals with your experiences with architecture and your experiences with spaces. So, Breakfast on the Mars was actually printed for and done for the Hotel New York. It was done in 1997, and I just have to make sure that I credit the people who actually did it. Um, it. The concept is actually by Maria Haydn and Willem van Zotendorf. And um, like I said, it was, um, it was adapted for this. So the characters here are my friend Laurie here who played the waiter. Laurier is also a fellow Canadian from Montreal. He arrived about four weeks ago. So be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I will play the man who is arriving and going into that restaurant. And I will talk with the waiter. So on that note, we begin. Alright. So the setting is in the Hotel New York in Rotterdam. It's around 8 o'clock in the evening and the restaurant is not busy. In fact, it's empty. Um, it's dark outside, the tables are set. I'm folding napkins, polishing silverware, writing something down. A man enters the empty restaurant. He's carrying a large overnight bag. The man sees the waiter near a table, puts his bag down, and approaches it. I don't suppose you remember me. Uh, you've been here before, but when? I was here with my spouse. We sat at this table. My spouse always likes to sit here. He never said so, but you could tell. If anyone came in, he was the first to see them. There used to be blue tablecloths. What happened to them? I'm not sure. My spouse loved blue. I could tell. Sometimes he'd say, it's a beautiful day, the sky is blue. My spouse was always up early. Before he went to work, he'd spend half an hour standing at windows. What are you doing? I'd ask him. I'm looking at the people on their bikes, at their knuckles, how white they are, how tightly they're gripped around the handlebars. <laughs> Do you still have those big blue tablecloths? Last year, we had one with a cigarette hole in the middle. My spouse always put his coffee cup on top of the hole so you wouldn't see it. One day I went down before he was and I put his cup on top. And when he came in, he asked, did you do that? <laughs> he didn't say another word all through dinner. Then he later said, don't ever do that again. All the holes have been 
demanded. I checked. They did a good job. You can hardly see a thing. I can feel them when I fold the tablecloths. There's a little bump, a rough spot. Like old postcards, the kind with a picture in relief. Sometimes, the guests send me a postcard to thank me for the good service. Do you hang them on the wall? Oh, no. I wouldn't want to make holes in them. I put them in a scrapbook along with my other postcards, the old ones. I collect those too. Buy them at the market. People had beautiful handwriting in the, in the old days. Beautiful D's, beautiful G's. My spouse had lo lovely handwriting, very slanty. The letter seemed to be leaning backwards. He wrote with a fountain pen. He kept it in a brown case, and whenever he began to write, he breathed on the pen like this. Have you saved all his letters? He never wrote me any letters. He never sent cards. He never wrote a note. Never left a message. Bills, that's all he's ever wrote. I used to type them out for him. I know his handwriting better than anyone. Do you know what happened last year we were sitting here in this very spot with all that water around us and all those blue tablecloths and suddenly he wrote down a sentence. Just one? He thought he didn't see. He crumpled up the paper, stuck it in his jacket pocket. That night I took it out. Do you know what he said? And all this time I've been looking at nothing. And all this time, I've been looking at nothing? I smoothed out the wrinkles and put it back in his pocket. He still has love behind my name. So at that point, what I want to do is I want to segue into why I even want you to experience that. Thanks a lot, Marie. Right. By the way, we are not professional actors, but if you are actually <laughs> want to actually hire us, you can actually <laughs> You know, when I was reading this, it was kind of interesting how they refer to old postcards. And when I'm doing my residency here, it's always very important for me to actually deal with the place, deal with what experiences I can take from this place. Being here three months in Rotterdam, of course, there's a lot of experiences and a lot of stories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe what this is. Like when I arrived, they had these tables lying all over the place. And then, of course, upon research, I realized that this building was built in 1880. It was originally a technical school. So there's generations of people from Rotterdam who studied here and honed in their technical skills on these very tables. And this one is, well, I'm not sure what the, I'm not sure what the history of this table is, but I kind of used it in a way, which is in my studio. And the chairs are, of course, the same thing. They're just here. I just found them here. <coughs> Like I said before, I actually go to the library a lot, and the Bibliotech Rotterdam is actually very close by. It's only about five minutes uh, cycling. And of course, I spend a lot of time in the art and architecture section reading all sorts of books. And I was very interested in what Rotterdam looked before World War II. <laughs> so I was looking at all these books, and I was thinking, I can't take out these books because I don't have a library card. So I photocopied some of the books, and that's what these are. This one is actually a, uh, a book on the architecture of Rotterdam from 1850 to 1940. And this particular one is actually a chapter of a book about Dutch architecture, and they had a maybe 16, 17 pages devoted to the history of architecture in Rotterdam. So what I do is I tend to sort of excavate them. It's almost like doing an excavation on written history. And you'll notice there's a lot of postcards. I also go to the market a lot. And every Saturday they have this really big market down at Kinaruta. I'm sure everybody here has been. But if you ever go on a Saturday and you ever see this dark haired man, probably from, from Morocco, wearing a top hat, you know, like what Fred Astaire would wear, his name is Ross. And he's a really nice guy. And I go to him, and one time he showed me, oh, I have four boxes of postcards for you to look at. And so it became 
became a ritual for me to actually go to the market and say hello to Ross. So every week I would go, and every, every time he would say, Did you know that you just spent two hours here? Not that I'm complaining. Do you want a coffee? It's very nice. <laughs> and I learned that he's from Dordrecht, and I learned that he's, uh, he's got a girlfriend, and I learned that he's, he was complaining during the month of Ramadan because he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't eating because he was fasting. So I knew at that time not to actually go to his stall with a bunch of fries in my hands. <laughs> but anyways, after, after like the third or fourth, fourth time I visited, it was quite interesting. I went over to him and said, Paul, my van is over there, your postcards are over there, you are family now. Go over there. <laughs> so that was very touching for me because for somebody who's coming in from, let's say, from Canada and not knowing anybody, that type of connection is really quite precious. So a lot of the things that I do with my work deals with what I call the soft software that that's attached to architecture. When you deal with architecture, you don't always deal with like, the practice of architecture, the hardness of architecture. But we have to also remember that architecture comes out of a social need. And that social need for architecture will define whether it whether architecture succeeds or not. So that's why I wanted to, to uh, tell you stories. Because these are stories that pertain to spaces. You know, the space that I live in here at Duende, the space that I go to, let's say, the market, to see Ross and to talk with him. All of these spaces have experiences in them. And we sometimes forget that architecture is not hard. It's, it's, there's still a softness to it. And so, so the work that I have here tends to do that. And, and what I want you to do is to actually play with it.